Now, on the note of DNA technology, what we've discovered is that all life on Earth is fundamentally related to each other. We know this because all life, all cells, remember all life is made out of cells, uses the same DNA. And I don't just mean they use the DNA molecule in order to code for their traits. I mean they use the same DNA language. Uh, and that language is, there's nothing special about it. It doesn't have to be that way. It could be any arbitrary usage of codes, but they use the same coding system uh, and the same amino acids, the same order of bases in, in such a specific way that you could take any gene from a human being and give it to an E. coli bacteria and it would understand. It, it would have a clear comprehension of that gene. It would be able to produce the proteins that that gene codes for. So all life on Earth speaks the same chemical language. And we can tell how closely two organisms are related to each other by how much DNA they have in common. In order to understand that, uh, if you were to take my DNA and you were to check all other organisms alive on the planet today to figure out which one has the most similar DNA to me, the organism with the most similar DNA to me is my brother. And the reason why we have such similar DNA is we share recent common ancestry, our parents, right? Now, the next one after my brother would be my cousin. My cousin and I also share recent common ancestry, just not as close as me and my brother. My brother and I share parents. My cousin and I share grandparents. My second cousin and I share great-grandparents. And as we get further and further away from me, we get to people who are related to me, but that I don't really think about as part of my family because they're like eighth cousins and I don't they, they, you know, I don't conceive of them uh, that way. Really, we know that all life on all humans, right, they were related to each other, but so distantly that we can't really think of them as being part of our family units. Well, it is the same way with life on Earth. Any two organisms, any two species, you can check how closely related they are, how recently they shared common ancestry by seeing how much DNA they have in common. So you may have heard that humans and chimpanzees share 98.6, 98.9% DNA in common. Well, that's true. There's some caveats on that. There's some technicalities involved. But that does not mean that chimpanzees evolved into humans. What it means is that at some point in the distant past, we both had a uh, an ancestor species. Before there were humans, before there were chimpanzees, there was this other species, right? And then before that species existed, there was the ancestor of all apes. And then after, before that species existed, there was the ancestor of all primates. And then before that, there was the ancestor of all mammals. And that's the idea of common ancestry, right? Things are or, uh, related to each other based on how recently they branched off. So if we look at all of these branches, it, get, it becomes cumbersome. It's hard to organize. So we have to start making some, some big divisions and saying, okay, this cluster of branches, we're going to call it this. This cluster of branches, we're going to call it that, and so on. Here's the first big division. Uh, we cut the tree of life into parts, and we say there are prokaryotes and there are eukaryotes. You are a eukaryote. The prokaryotes are separated into two different domains. So prokaryotes are single-celled organisms and they are very primitive. They're, and by primitive I mean they are old and simple. They've been around for three and a half billion years. They've been here a long time. Uh, and bacteria are an example of a prokaryote. So there are two domains of prokaryotes. You have bacteria and another one called archaea. And I'll talk more about archaea a little bit later, but we are mostly going to talk about pro, uh, we're mostly going to talk about bacteria in this course. They are smaller than eukaryotic cells. They're always single celled. They have much simpler structures and they've been around for a much longer time. So those are the two prokaryotic domains is bacteria and archaea. 
But we are in the third domain, which is Eukarya. Eukarya is broken into four kingdoms of life. And you're familiar with these kingdoms. You're at least familiar with three of them, and you're probably familiar with the, the fourth one, even if you don't know it. The four kingdoms are Plantae, the plants, Animalia, the animals, Fungi, the funguses, and Protista, the uh, algae, largely. Uh, there's some variation in that. Uh, some, some of these protists are animal-like, some of them are plant-like, some of them are fungus-like, some of them are multicellular, some of them are um, like giant seaweed, giant kelp is actually a protist, not a plant. Uh, there's, there's very few rules with the protists. Now, domain eukarya is separated into four kingdoms, but those kingdoms are each further subdivided. So we remember when I said the tree of life looks like all these different branches. Well, first we separate it into prokaryotes and eukaryotes. The prokaryotes are separated into bacteria and archaea. The eukaryotes are separated into four kingdoms. Here they are. And then let's take animals and we're going to separate them even further. So we have Domain eukarya here, domain eukarya, and it includes all of these different animals. You'll see there's an abundance of bears, and there's a reason for that. Uh, we have all of these different kinds of mammals. We have mammals, and we have reptiles, and we have birds, and we have fish, and we have invertebrates, insects. We have uh, sea sponges. We have uh, protozoa. We have fungi, we have plants, all of them are in domain eukarya. If we go to kingdom, then we're just looking at the animals. And sea sponges are an animal, right? Insects are an animal, sea stars are an animal, fish are animals, reptiles and birds, amphibians, obviously mammals are all animals. So we have kingdom animalia. If we got more specific, we broke kingdom down into different categories, we'd be looking at phyla. So a phylum, here we have phylum chordata. There's a lot of different phyla. Chordata means that they have a backbone. Well, I, I'm so... Chordata actually means that they have a, a nervous cord. They, they have a, um, a bundle of nerves going down their back. Vertebrata. Means that they have a, uh, it's encased in bone. I overgeneralized. Within chordata, subphylum vertebrata, we have class mammalia. Now, you might be familiar with some of the characteristics of mammals. Uh, for example, they have fur. Uh, they are warm-bodied. We say ectothermic. Uh, they have live births, right? Mammals don't lay eggs. But you also might know that there's some exceptions there. And the mammals tend to have fur. Even dolphins, right, have fur. Dolphins are a kind of mammal. It's just very, very fine. But you say, ah, oh, they look like they don't have fur. So maybe that's an exception. You know that maybe monotremes, like platypus, actually lays eggs, but it's still considered a mammal. So that's kind of an exception there. So what really defines a mammal? And it's the ability to give milk. Mammal, mammary glands, uh, that's what we are named after. So these are milk giving animals. Everything else is a characteristic that is a generalization about mammals. Milk is really our primary characteristic. If we look at a subtype of mammal, we're in order carnivora, and as it sounds like, these are generally meat-eating animals. Now, up until this point, Eukarya, Animalia, Chordata, Vertebrata, Mammalia, we were in this category. We were in all of these categories up until here. Here, at the order point, we branch off, we would be in primate. But the animals that they're categorizing are carnivores. 
meat eaters. Family, Ursidae, and you can see that what we have left in the family are bears, right? So what's happening is we're getting fewer and fewer branches of the tree of life as we go. We're getting more and more specific. The family, now, we're just looking at bears, right? They're all very similar kinds of organisms. For us, it would be hominidae, which would be the apes, the great apes. So gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, us, orangutans. More specific than a family is a genus. In this case, Ursus. So Ursidae is the bears. It includes sun bears, and it includes uh, panda bears, and it includes black bears and polar bears and grizzly bears. But in Ursus, we get rid of the sun bears and the panda bears, and we just have the black bears, the polar bears, and the grizzly bears. And then for species, we just have Ursus americanus, the black bear, here. Species is specific. That's why it's called that, right? It's only one kind of organism is in the species. A species scientific name is always two parts, and it's the genus name, Ursus, followed by a specific species name. Now for humans, right, we're in family hominidae, the apes, we're in genus homo, and we are species sapiens. So you may have heard our scientific name before, we are homo sapiens, which means wise men, right? We, we named ourselves, we're allowed to, so that's what we went with. So all of life, is first divided into three domains. Bacteria, uh, archaea, which are two prokaryotic domains, followed by eukarya. Eukarya is divided into four kingdoms. I'll stop putting numbers now because it starts to get big. The kingdoms are divided further into phylums, and then the phylum are divided into classes. Classes into orders, orders into families, families into genuses, and genuses into species. The way to remember this is, with the mnemonic, and every biology student learns this, deer, king, Philip, came, over, for, great, Oh, God, can I spell spaghetti? Spaghetti. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Okay? Each one is getting more and more specific. Domain, general, right? Domain eukarya is everything from the fungus that gives you athlete's foot to you. Okay, but uh, genus, right, it includes just uh, us and, say, Neanderthals. That's very specific. Let's see here. Uh, let me just read the rest of this slide to make sure I haven't left anything out. Scientific names ease communication by unambiguously identifying organisms. So I will give you an example here. We are Homo sapiens. I just gave you another example of another member of our genus. It's an extinct member, Homo neanderthalus. There have been other members of our genus. We're just the only ones currently living. The others are extinct. We are extant, E-X-T-A-N-T. It makes it easier to recognize the discovery of new species, and that is because each one of these categories, each one of these categories here, 
has very specific characteristics associated with it. And once you go through and you check a new, or you discover a new organism, you check to see which characteristics it has. And when you get all the way down the list, if you get to species and it has characteristics that are not consistent with any of the known species, you've discovered something new. So you can really easily figure out if you've discovered a new species or not. All right, so why do we need to go through all this work with scientific names? Uh, if you grew up in this area, we're in, uh, I'm teaching in Pennsylvania for those of you who uh, are not actually part of my class. This is what we call a daddy long legger around here. If you're in California, this is what you might call a daddy long legger. Now, in Pennsylvania, we have a story about these daddy long leggers, these ones right up here. It's the most venomous spider in the world, but its fangs are so small that they can't penetrate your skin, so you don't need to worry about it. Which is the most incorrect scientific fact that has ever been stated by anyone. Number one. That is not a spider. This, not a spider. So it can't be the most venomous spider. Two, not venomous. So it can't be the most venomous anything. And three, doesn't really have fangs. It has little mouth parts that it uses to cut up bits of leaves because that's what it does. It cuts up little bits of leaf litter in the forest to help recycle uh, it and, and make it easier for bacteria and fungi to return it to soil. Uh, so these guys are what we call a daddy long layer. But in California, this is a spider. And no, it is, it's not the most venomous spider in the world either. And if we just used the, the standard name, the common name for these, we would be, and I wrote a paper about daddy longleggers, people in California would think I was talking about something completely different. So we use scientific names and this whole classification scheme of domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, in order to make sure that everyone knows which species is being discussed. We would be able to figure out that, oh, they mean something completely different by going through uh, the tax, this is called taxonomy, the taxonomic structure like that.